Welcome to Six Picks Music Club, a music podcast for people who know that edging isn't just part of mowing the lawn. Hey, hey, hey. I'm your host, Dave, and with me are my favorite cohorts. Fuck. All right, let's try this again. (laughs) My favorite cohorts. (laughs) What's up? What's up, everybody? (laughs) I'm your host, Dave, and with me are my two favorite co-hosts of all time. First off, we have the sea lion falling from a helicopter, Jeffro. Yeah. And last but not least, the dude who won't stop you from drinking, cooking sherry at his engagement party, <laughs> Russ. Hey, guys. What up? What up? How's everybody doing this week? Good. Doing fine this week. Hey, listener. How are you? Great. Awesome. Thanks. Well, we are Six Picks Music Club, the music podcast where we three each pick two songs around a central theme and discuss. This week on The Up, our topic revolves around artists going solo, where we pick a song from their early group work and later solo projects. But yeah, before we do anything, we got to get this week's password to get into the clubhouse. Who has the password? Jeffro, is it you again? Here I go again on my own. Is the password. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) And... uh... Yeah, I guess I guess that one checks out. We're in. Okay, come on in, everybody. Find your space. <laughs> it's White Snake. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> How is that? I I'm I'm missing. Dude, this episode is about somebody being in a band and then going solo. Here I go again on my own. Yeah. Okay. Now I get it. <laughs> uh, good one. Good one. Am I the only one that's trying? <laughs> I was getting caught up on just stupid TV that I used to watch. I didn't watch the uh, Hard Knock show, the football show they do on HBO or whatever. What is with every football coach addressing their team as men? Like, we already know that you're strong and endure a lot of, like, physical pain and whatnot for our enjoyment, gambling addictions and, and whatnot. But is that is that necessary? Like, Would you prefer that they referred to them as little women? Is that... That's not what I'm saying. It's just like... Louisa May Alcott level. <laughs> It's like they're addressing them because it's like, hey, I respect you. And all of these other guys are just not they're not professional football players. So it just seems way too formal for a bunch of dudes that are sitting around all stinky in their jocks and, you know, and towels and whatnot. Right. It's the difference between empire and post empire. Like Mike McDaniel, the young coach of the Miami Dolphins, he's not going up and saying, listen, man, because he's he's like the cool, the innovative Mm, young coach. Okay, But like. But I bet Andy Reid calls his players men, you know, because he's like 75 years old. Yeah. I'm like Vrabel. He's definitely a calling the guys men kind of guy. It's like, I respect you too much to say guys. Dan Campbell of the Lions. I bet he calls his players men. (laughs) These are just some strong men in here. (laughs) We're men. All, All you other people, you're just, you're not men. It's emasculating. I don't know. It's kind of weird. Does anybody else want to go eat a quad shot Americano cup right now? (laughs) Dude, honestly, I'd rather just drink it, but I guess if I got to eat it too, it's weird. I just think it's weird, but maybe that's just me. It's because you've been indoctrinated by your household of women that you live in. You're starting to give over to their way of thinking so hard that you don't even understand why a man would call another man a man anymore. You've lost the ability to see it. No, I mean, I think (laughs) men calling another man, hey, man, what (laughs) man calling man is still fine, but man calling men (laughs) is not, that's weird. Yeah, I don't mind if a man calls a man a man. I (laughs) mind if a man calls men men. I do not like that. A group of men, <laughs> men, in this like yeah. formal, like, you're better than everybody. It's just, I don't know. Men. <laughs> They're all going to die when they're 38. So it's just like, what are we? <laughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> Death has reared its ugly head for the first time. Since you were talking to men, calling men, men. Right. Which I think we can file under the heading of Dave's issues with masculinity. <laughs> Here's, a, here's another one. Guys, some of their approaches to fatherhood are they blow my fucking mind. And because they'll be like, 
Like, there are just some guys out there that think that babies and kids are a woman thing. Yeah. And they just are like, I'll just make more kids and then all the women will deal with them and I'm I am a free agent. Right. And they just live their whole lives like that. That shit is crazy town to me. I cannot even imagine thinking that, you know, I love that he has never said anything about this, but he's had a daughter for three weeks. And here we go. (laughs) (laughs) Shit, my little baby girl really changed me in my way of thinking about the world. We've all been thinking that for what, 10 years, 11 years now. Right, Russ? Yeah. Well, okay. So I heard this stat the other day. It was like 73% or 78% of millennials believe that they are better parents than their parents. (laughs) Well, yeah. Which I think is right. Yeah, it is right. We're having kids later. Yeah. We have internet. So we go looking to see if there's a better way than just like beating the shit out of them, you know, like, (laughs) what? Let me beat the shit out of you. Okay, cool. Go get a switch. I'm going to whip your ass with it. (laughs) Oh, my God. That's the generation that I came from, you know, like, we we got hit. Get a cloth and a gallon of water. I'm going to waterboard you. (laughs) Oh, Lord. Oh, my God, Dad. It works. It works. There are no more Legos on the floor. I'm telling you, I didn't say shit the rest of the day. Great. <laughs> and it thwarted a couple of the terrorist attacks that I was planning. <laughs> I'm happy now to transition into the music portion of the podcast, Dave. (laughs) Good, good. I'm happy too. Russ, when we thought about this topic, I know you're big on the, let's see, two sides of the coin thing. Tell me what you were thinking of when you started making your picks this week. My first pick is looking at the world around you, essentially. Okay. And the second pick is like looking at like your world. And so I took kind of a, a younger kind of, post-hardcore punky band who was kind of angry and and then took it to a more introspective place from Frank Turner who left the band to go solo and and frankly has had a bigger career because of it. Oh, nice. Right on. I'll say that Russ definitely imputed a lot into the topic that I hadn't imputed. (laughs) So (laughs) I just chose a guy that was in one band that did a song that I know, and then he did another song by himself later. <laughs> well, um, dang, Jeff, you wanna you wanna fire us off tonight? What's uh, what's the first one you wanna you wanna talk about? Yeah, since obviously mine's the simplest. Like that's I think that we're already we've already established that. So I'll establish the premise Easy on ramp a little bit. <laughs> yeah. And la- later we're going 115 miles per hour on the Audubon doing Russ's picks, but mine are just like student driver. <laughs> yeah. So it, it is very simplistic, which is I was telling Russ while you, Dave, were having technological problems for 45 minutes when we were trying to sign on to this thing. Yeah, it was a bit of a beating. And then you came in and ruined the call and then we all had problems and then we figured it out just to go back over it. But in that period of time. <laughs> um, I was talking to Russ about, dude, I have a favorite new channel on Canada TV. That's what I call it. I don't even know what it is. I don't know how we get it. I don't know any, there's so many channels. I don't know what any of them mean. Oh. So I have a channel that's just called, it's, I don't know what the channel's called, but the program that's always on it is called Please Rewind. And it's just old music videos. Anyway, I was tuned in, just watching music videos, doing some homework or whatever. and. The video for Red Rider's Lunatic Fringe came on. Lunatic Fringe, I know you're out there, which is like a really kind of a weird 80s song. It's like genre bending. And I was looking at the guys and they're like kind of a bunch of weird, stiff looking guys. And it's kind of a bit of a dark video, but in a fun way with neon lights and stuff. And then it like comes down on this kind of arrhythmic white guy that's singing. And I was like, who is who is this guy? And then I it dawned on me in that moment. Boom. That's a younger Tom Cochran, the Canadian artist that would later go solo. And I was like, dude, I didn't know he did that shit. When you hear the song, everybody's heard the song. And it's because it peaked at number 11 
on the billboard charts in the U S in like 1981. And a lot of people thought it was in reference to John Lennon's murder, but he actually written it before that. Anyway, song is red Rider lunatic fringe. End it, you know, maybe end it a little bit faster, but, uh, Um, he gets on to Russ's favorite you, parts, the, the solos. So the great the great font of factual information Wikipedia claims that he wrote this song about anti-Semitism in the United States in the 1970s. Yep. Nazism and like racial discrimination, right? Yeah. But he decided to record the song on the evening of John Lennon's murder. Ooh. So that's why there was a connection to John Lennon. Ah. What do you guys think about this song? Well, you've heard it, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't say I've heard this song a lot in my life, but I've always been, like, intrigued by it because I was, like, trying to place it. Uh-huh. And I was like, where where does this, like, when did this song happen? Yeah. I know I've heard it a number of times here and there. It's like a classic rock song. Right. It used to play on the radio all the time. But I've never looked at the lyrics before now, and I'm like, what is going on in this song? I know, it's fascinating (laughs) lyrics, and it's about the lunatic fringe, like the crazy people, and it's almost like, in some ways, predicting 30 or 40 years after it came out, you know, like with the internet and everything. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, So it's kind of prescient in a way, but I've never known anything about it at all, and it's because it's by a one hit wonder, Red Rider, you've never heard of them, you know the song. It's on my playlist, but I had no idea until I saw this music video that it's Tom Cochran is the lead singer of Red Rider, which is a big deal for me for a couple of reasons. One, I I now live in Toronto and he is Toronto born rock and roller Okay, that has traveled the world and he's a good human. He's won awards, but he's also promoted peace and etc. Like he's a good dude. Yeah, no, he's known for philanthropic. Philanthropic? That's not right. <laughs> Philanthropic is the lead singer of Pantera, right? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, his philanthropic work, he's uh, he's known for that. The reason that all this comes together in my life is because 10 years after this song, I would have been eight years old. My number one song in the world was Tom Cochran's Life is a Highway. <laughs> while people just thought that songs had to last five minutes oh yeah i love and will defend the song to you guys shortly but it would be a great three and a half minute song and it is a (laughs) five and a half minute song i feel like there's so many songs that should be like that 98 percent of the foo fighters catalog should be Three and a half minute songs. Yeah, I guess the thinking is that like it's kind of an earworm song when you get the chorus in your head, you just are repeating it over and over. And that's kind of what the song is doing. The song is really giving you a lot of that chorus after a while. It's like, here it's coming again. (laughs) It's like, okay, now we're live as a <laughs> Mr. Big was a was a, was heavy in the rotation for me during that era as well. For a while, I thought they were the same band. Oh, what was that song called? The Mr. Big song? To be with you. Yeah, I'm the one who wants to be with you. Be with you. Yeah, right. So uh, you thought that was Red Rider? Right, because I didn't have MTV growing up. We only saw videos when we were at like Little Caesars or whatever, some pizza place. <laughs> that sucks so much. <laughs> you had to just do a little, you had to listen to the radio and make little sock puppet videos. <laughs> with your fucking cousins. <laughs> sucks. Caleb, my oldies, baby. It was a, it was a real deal. Different upbringing. Well, that's why you try so hard about music, and I'm just like cool about it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) just kidding, dude. Anyway, what were you saying about Life Is a Highway? You thought it was a you thought it was a Mr. Big song. In my my age of innocence, I thought these were the same band, but they're not. And I appreciate you picking it and 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 reaffirming that for me because. With Red Rider, it's like you said with the uh, the one hit wonder thing. Like I knew that song, but I didn't know that band. 
Yep. Great with the Tom Cochran pick there. Thanks. I really love Life is a Highway. It's a positive message about traveling the world, which Tom Cochran is also, he's a philanthropist and world traveler. And in 2016, Manitoba named a section of the Provincial Road 391, Tom Cochran's Life is a Highway. So he's got that going for him. I guess it's Tom Cochran's Life is a Highway. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, tonight life got it right. Didn't he win like eight? What is the Canadian award for music? Yeah, I just call him like Canada things. I just he won eight Canada <laughs> the, things. Of the award. Juno award, eight time Juno award winner. I just got, I still haven't updated about that. I just call him Canada <laughs> things. Russ, I would love to hear from you about your picks this week. Coming with our post punk picks. For the pod, what do you got? That's so many peas, Jesus. Yeah, a lot of peas. That was like you wrote it and then <laughs> and then said it bad. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could say I wrote it. I just I just said it bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so as I was saying earlier, I I took I took a band, Million Dead, which is kind of a post hardcore high energy band who was commenting on the world around them, and this particular song is called Charlie and the Propaganda Myth Machine off of their 2003 debut album, A Song to Ruin. May I make a bold statement? Sure. You've given us 30 picks by now, Russ, in our all of our recordings. Yep. That one for me would be number one so far. It hangs out in that timeline where most of your picks come from. So it's... <laughs> yeah. I can hear that. The 90s. Is that what you're trying to say? I went to my grandpa file. of. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm just saying it, it kind of fits in there. It's like, I mean, because it kind of give off like at the... It's like 2003, right? Yeah. At the drive-in vibes. Yeah. Stripped down and a little more raw, probably. Is it before or after them? After. after yeah, for sure. I was going to say that it sounded like at the drive-in for sure with all the tempo changes and stuff. It's like at the drive-in and Rage got together and just yep. yeah. kind of had too much whiskey and then like had this child. Yeah, and like, oh, I'm going to try to squeeze neoliberalism into the lyrics here. <laughs> I think I could do it. <laughs> they de- yeah, they definitely did. If you think about it, Willy Wonka had a monopoly on chocolate and candy, right? And in that story, and neoliberals love wealthy entrepreneurs. And while Charlie may have been the story's hero, everybody loves Willy Wonka. Yeah, yeah. Right? He's like he's like the best part of the story. Yeah, neoliberalism, McDonald's and sandwiches. I love that he just starts <laughs> off like getting right into Walt Disney. It's just like, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh man, yeah. This song is about corporations, <laughs> man. Right? It's like, Social and sexual hierarchy coming from Walt. It's just like the social and sexual hierarchy <laughs> is coming to me down. They're going after like the, the commercialization that mm-hmm. starts at the beginning of our lives. Like as we're like children, like that's where they get us and they take us the whole way, right? Yeah. I feel like the band just comes out and they just like they grab you by the balls, right? This and they're like, listen, here we go. Which is kind of fun. You got Frank Turner who is just wailing above the mix, just emoting during his screams, and he's also melodic and versatile w- within that, which is cool. And then he's got a pretty good singing voice too. So we said earlier, the song is about the commercialization of our lives, starting when we're children. And, you know, they've come out, they fire shots at Cadbury, McDonald's, and specifically Roald Dahl, right? The uh, the song is oh yeah a play on Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Dude, I've long thought Cadbury needs to get it. <laughs> <laughs> they've been on your hit list for a while. <laughs> yeah, dude, they just, here's more eggs, and I'm all like, fuck eggs. <laughs> Cadbury. <laughs> I'm moving on to omelets, you son of a bitch. I mean, you've always known that about me, Dave, that Cadbury just, in all of its abuses. <laughs> well, here's one thing. They're disrespectful to bunnies. That's true. It's like bunny blackface, chocolate bunnies. It's not okay. Oh, no. How have they not been canceled yet? That's just like. Are they getting bunny consent? Certainly not. And did they get the copyright infringement issue worked out with the image of that first bunny? No. That bunny that's on every one of their molds never got any kickbacks, nothing. The family is destitute. Like, it's unbelievable. They're living under a bridge right now. 
And he should be a billionaire. Whole family, all 58 of them. Fucking Cadbury. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's like, at the end, it's like, hold out the arm and quiet the voice. Mm. This is kind of going back to what Jeff was saying when we were talking about kids and parenting and stuff these days. And like the older generations believe that children should be seen and not heard. And that the youth voice and ideas, you know, they should be silenced and just do what they're told, right? Just be formed into the person that current society wants them to be like apathetic and unquestioning followers, right? And I, and I think maybe because we are spending more time with our children and treating them as people more so and not like, you know, farm hands or whatever, you know, you hear how Gen Z's constantly being considered more empathetic and kind toward each other, right? Mm, yeah. And I think it's because their parents are the ones who started this. Okay. I was going to agree with Russ that while we were all children listening to Green Day's Liquid Dookie record, we were coming up with better ways to be parents, you know, that we were going <laughs> to unleash on the world when, when it was time. Yeah, they had a plan all along. In 2005, Million Dead broke up, and Frank Turner has gone on record just talking about how, at the end, everybody wanted to kill each other, and they were just riding around in this van, and, and he was proud of the music they made, but that band had to break up. So he broke out and has turned it into a very successful solo career. And the solo song that I'm picking tonight is called Four Simple Words, off of his Tape Deck Heart album. the way that song starts i feel like this dude he's making good music it's interesting it's kind of strange that stylistic variation genre shift that they do where it's like he just repeats it again but in a totally different style that's fun yeah he calls this his queen song yeah i could see that yeah i picked that up structure kind of like bohemian rhapsody yeah definitely so frank turner's four simple words it speaks to me on many levels. One of the opening lyrics is colleagues and friends condescend with a smile, but this is my culture. This is my home. And like, I get that. I feel like he's talking about the punk rock scene. Yeah. And I feel like I deal with that every week with you guys, right? Like you guys are like, Oh yeah, great. Cool. Nice one. Good one. Okay. Moving on. Let's, let's get to the music that we do like. Let's cut them off a lot and just see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we only have them here for our own enjoyment. So he's talking about the punk rock scene and pretty much, you know, the shows he's at or he goes to with like-minded people who just are there to have a good time, which I think is cool. Right. I mean, I think we all understand that. There are just some lines in here where I'm like, man, and I feel like it's kind of where I'm at. Like, there's like the one where he's talking about he wants bands that work really hard and that, you know, they drive a thousand miles and on no sleep and then they show it up to like play super hard and then they move on to the next one and, you know, kind of that whole mentality of just being a hardworking band. And, and I feel like, I mean, you know how I feel about hard work. Yeah. You think that it's equally important to kindness and helpfulness. Core values. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I, but I think like to see a band that, you know, is just traveling, that isn't especially living luxury and they're going out there and they're just killing it night after night, just putting on electric shows. Yeah. That band wants to be there. You cannot fake putting on like a crazy, energetic show bouncing around all night i think you just get burned out if you weren't into it yeah i think the that's where we're punk rock they're the real ones you know like you can't fake that that's a that's a real thing sometimes i go see like legacy artists i say i say legacy i don't know and then like you just like man like they're getting paid a shit ton of money and they're like you could have put a little more effort into that i tend to stay away from so you got your neil young and crazy horse tickets is what you're telling me <laughs> Dude, he'll go up there and he'll still grind his axe, man. He, and Neil Young will impress you for an 80-year-old man. I envy his energy for sure. That's awesome. Yeah, and I think that's and that's the band I want to see. Yeah. So earlier, Ep, Jeff said that, uh, he said, man, nobody goes to opening bands, right? But like, I fucking go to see the opening band. That's where I go see, right? Yeah. Toward the end of the song, he's talking about how somebody told him that guitars were going out of fashion and... He's like, man, that shit wasn't fashionable when I fell in love with it. And then my favorite line of the whole song is, if the hipsters move on, why should I give a fuck? Which I'm like, man, that's great. Mm -hmm. That's the mentality or the attitude, which is cool because I feel like rock and roll has been dying ever since I've been listening to it. But what does it mean, right? It's dying because you can't go to a club and grind to it or that it doesn't attract millions and millions of listeners and pack 96,000 people into a stadium. I mean, 
I'm not denying that. I guess like several bands have traded in their guitars for synths, wouldn't you say? And I think it's fine if that's what they want to do. But I'm glad you brought this up, Russ, because when rock and roll was hegemonic, when it was the number one thing, which has now been surpassed by hip hop, hip hop is way more popular. Yeah, oh yeah, for sure. And so it's like whatever you would call Taylor Swift, like that's the big stuff now. And that's you know, what it is. But when rock was the number one thing, it sucked. It was horrible. It was like fucking Skid Row and Motley Crue and shit. You know, like that's what we were treated to when rock was the the greatest thing. Oh, no, I, I hear it. Yeah. So maybe it's better that rock is kind of like in the resistance. Like it's it's underground a little bit. That's a really good point. I like that. I think you're probably right. Maybe it is good that rock is fighting to stay alive in its own way. Yeah. You ever hear that expression? You fall in love and you get fat. I feel like that happened to rock music. Like people fell in love with it. And then it just like love makes you fat. (laughs) Love makes you fat. Totally. I don't hold a lot of affinity for some of the hair metal bands of of that era. Certainly. Yeah. I was listening to Amy Grant at that time. (laughs) Baby, baby, I love you like my father. (laughs) God. I want you to take me to the mall and get some leather. Stop for a minute. Wait, what what do you want? (laughs) You want me to take you to get leather? Right. (laughs) I will say that if you get injured, the best person to have around is Dave. Honestly, I know this from experience. We used to work as stage hands together at a performing arts center. We were putting the seating element together. A bar came down and hit Karen directly on top of the head. And it was like a big metal bar. So it was the equivalent of she basically got hit in the head with a bat, like a Louisville slugger to the skull. Jeez, man. And she falls down on the ground And I was just simply processing the series of events. I was sitting here looking at her like, oh, man, you just got fucking cranked in the head by that seating (laughs) element. Oh, are you okay?" Like and she was dazed and obviously like bleeding. And I was just trying to communicate with her. And Dave, meanwhile, was ripping his undershirt into to make like a skull cap for her. This is true. (laughs) By the time I was even like processing what was up and then he like scooped her up. And got her to the hospital somehow. I like all in like what felt like five seconds. And it was incredible. And I was I was just like, anyways, like, do you think we're still gonna go get coffee later? <laughs> or like are you hurt? <laughs> That's Boy Scout training, huh, Dave? Yeah, Boy Scouts grew up with all that and everything, Eagle Scout and such, but that's first aid stuff that we learn or whatever. But I actually did do the Heimlich maneuver uh, one time at work years later, like 2012. I was working at an apartment store out in California, I ran restaurants for them. And- that sounded like the beginning of a story, like uh, from a Western. I was out at work at an old diner in the stagecoach era. <laughs> Just on the other side uh, where the 49ers first pitched the tents. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> when did you do that? <laughs> my, one of my coworkers like was eating lunch and and uh, started choking, and I I had to do the Heimlich maneuver. It was like I was like, hey, are you? I put my hands in my throat. Are you are you choking? And they're like. They couldn't breathe or whatever, and <laughs> they were doing the choking motion. I was like, okay, cool. And I went around and I said, I'm about to do the Heimlich. Is that okay? And they're like, yeah, uh, uh, or whatever. And so, so I got around there and I gave it a, a jerk and, and it didn't come out. And so I was like, so I repositioned and got my back into it and out it came. And then it was like, I don't know, it happened in 30 seconds. And so people were all just kind of looking around and saying like, what, what, what happened just there or what? Is, are you okay? <laughs> Did they think that you were like making a move on her like a like a humpback gorilla? <laughs> <laughs> I just I just caught feelings like in the middle of lunch. Yeah. Just, at uh, work. Uh, uh, <laughs> Jesus. We're we're just trying to have a sandwich, dude. <laughs> yeah. Um <laughs> It's, it's one of the reasons why they don't recommend uh, having an erection when you perform the Heimlich maneuver. <laughs>
All right, so conk to me. It's my turn to go. So unlike Jeff, I went with some actual cool songs that are good. And the first <laughs> one is by... Oh, man. <laughs> Dom DeLuise laughed at that, but Jesus. It's a little British band in 1967 by the band Traffic. Oh, yeah. The song that I'm picking first is uh, Dear Mr. Fantasy. Yeah, man. It's a psych rock song from the late 60s mid to late was it 67 while steve winwood didn't actually write that song he did the music i am going to focus a little bit on the steve winwood element here but uh yeah i like that song a lot it's one of those that has kind of come back into the pop culture world as it was used in the avengers endgame movie when tony stark is is looking at old pictures and stuff it is a, a psych rock classic and been covered by a bunch of bands like Grateful Dead, Crosby Stills, and Nash. It's a long one. Their live performances of it go 10 minutes long. Did they fade out with the solo going? Yeah, yeah. The engineer was just like, that's enough. (laughs) 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 There's a lot of like late 60s drug references in there and talking about getting to a higher plane. And that flute solo is a real trippy kind of feel to it. Dave's always been a sucker for flute solos. I love a good flute. The lady I took to senior prom, she was in the band and she played the flute. So maybe there is something there. The skin flute? I bet she did. (laughs) (laughs) I did not. I did not say that. She played the instrument of the flute, not the... Golly, you guys. Killing me. But uh, yeah, so uh, this was the titular single off of their debut record. Half titular. Dear Mr. Fantasy is the name of the record, as well as, oh, is it just Mr. Fantasy, the album? Oh, please don't be discovering an insignificant effect. Uh, oh, the album is just titled Mr. Fantasy. So it's a half titular song. Yeah. Great band, great song. Love it. But, you know, unexplained departure. Steve Winwood never really says a clear explanation, but. Rumor has it that there was a a little bit of a disagreement between guitarist Dave Mason and and he left the band. And then the other three just kind of wanted to pursue more bluesy, more folk sound. And so so they all went separate ways. And Stevie Winwood's like, okay, cool. I'm going to go dominate the airwaves for a while, you chumps. Good luck. Good luck making your solo Dave Mason record, turd. (laughs) You know, it's a little bit of a change in direction, this next song that I've got, but it is Steve Winwood's Higher Love that is my solo pick. It's just another one that's like, let's make a three and a half minute song, five minute song. It's (laughs) happening again. Something about the 80s. Yeah, that's almost a six minute song. Got some average male penis length there. What's the higher love that he's been waiting for? What are we talking about? Well, so they do talk a little bit about transcending beyond a like a a romantic love, but like a spiritual thing. So with a partner or with like God, what are we talking about? It could be whatever you want it to be. Is it on an airplane? (laughs) (laughs) So back before we had text messages, artists would get together and they would record songs to each other to kind of like send dick pics. And this is like, hey, do you want to go on a plane and get higher love? Is that is that what we're thinking? <laughs> what year did you say the traffic song came out? 67, I think, is what I and said. What, what year did this come out? This was in 86. So 19 years? 19 years. So he wrote that song when he was 19 years old and he wrote this song or he wrote the music for that song when he was 19 years old. And he wrote this song with uh, he worked with James Horner to write the lyrics for this song. He wrote uh, My Heart Will Go On. So it's like eh, it's kind of maybe where the contribution for like a introspective yearning nature of the lyrics comes from. But huh. James Horner's got his touch on it. Yeah. That's cool. But uh, no, it's just a fun song. It's like, you know, easy breezy, beautiful cover girl, if you know what I mean. (laughs) And like we do with every show, there's a link in the show notes to get you to that Spotify playlist where you can listen to all the songs in their entirety. Go check it out and shoot us an email on the site, sixpixmusic.club, to let us know who your favorite bandmate turned solo artist is and why ours suck. 
like and subscribe and all that stuff too if you haven't already because we we have a lot of great stuff coming up there's so much new music out right now i really love this time of year so i heard more of the new beyonce record and i feel like she just like heard a lumineers record and was like i can clap Tom. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious clap stomp clap stomp clap clap stomp <laughs> I know. Hold. Oh, and they yell, "Hey, hey, ho!" I love that she's fucking with country music, and and I I I love the whole project of it. But do you think that Beyonce's Jolene is as good as the original Jolene? I think it's an interesting take. I really appreciate where she's coming from. That is such horse ass, dude. Listen, I think Beyonce's awesome. It's not about her. I'm just saying. Hey, we are not going to become the pod that says, like, Beyonce's not awesome, so get your fucking shit in line. <laughs> That's exactly what I didn't say. <laughs> there are five million people that are going to come and kill you. They're called the Beehive. I would say one of the best concerts I've ever been to was Beyonce Superdome. Like, I've, I've seen her play, and it's amazing. She's incredible. And I love Destiny's Child. But this country record is not good, is what I'm saying. It's a great Beyonce record. It's not supposed to be Well, it's a being billed as a country record. That's just to get her a whole second group of people to buy albums. <laughs> yeah, she needs different, different awards, right. Why are we arguing about something we agree about? It doesn't make any sense. What the hell's wrong with you? It's so late. It's so late. That's going to do it for us today here at Six Picks Music Club. Thank you, listener, as always, for joining us. If you have any solo artists that you think are better than ours, go ahead and shoot us an email at the website, sixpicksmusic.club, or comment on the YouTube at Six Picks Music. Thanks again. I'm Dave, and we will see you next time here at Six Picks Music Club. This episode of Six Picks Music Club was produced by Finn Gamayas. <laughs> Finn Gamayas. <laughs> Edited by Isaac D. Snuts. With special thanks as always to Dixie Rex. Dixie Rex.